In this video, learn what we mean when we say desk adjusting, how you can earn really good money as a desk adjuster, how to get this kind of work, and how to get good at this kind of work, starting now. This is Adjuster TV. Adjuster TV is brought to you by Paysetter Claim Service. Download the remote work guide at adjustertv.com slash paysetter and by Kaplik. Learn all about e &O and other insurance for adjusters at cplic.net slash adjuster TV and by Eberl Claim Service. Get your career started right now at eberls.com and by the IA firm Crawford & Company. It's not too late to get early bird pricing on the 2022 Crawford Cat Conference at croco.com slash cat. Okay, so we're gonna talk about being a desk adjuster. Like what exactly does that mean? Who is a desk adjuster? What are the different roles as a desk adjuster? Um, basically, when we say the the when we say a desk adjuster, basically what we're talking about is somebody who takes either the entire claim or a part of a claim and handles it from the desk, right? So in other words, from their computer, um, they may do phone work uh, related to doing some kind of desk work. Um, for our purposes as independent adjusters, um, we can do a few different roles as a desk adjuster. We can be a person who will um, handle the writing part of the claim. So in other words, if somebody is in the field, that maybe they split the role up, right? So somebody's working out in the field and they're taking photos and they're writing a scope of damages. So they'll have a whole bunch of photos of, you know, da hail damage to a roof, gutters and siding and a couple of windows and maybe a water spot on the ceiling, right? So it's a pretty typical claim. They will send that up either through some kind of an app or in Xactimate, they might do a little, you know, a little scope and have their photos and everything in, in a Xactimate file, which they then upload. And then the, the desk person who could be in the same town or they could be 2000 miles away sitting at home, or they could be in a uh, remote or a, basically something like a call center or a, a facility or building that an IA firm or a carrier has set up, <clears throat> excuse me, has set up for adjusters to work out of, right? So they'll provide all the computers and everything. And you, you show up at seven o'clock in the morning, you sit there and you do your work all day long. And then at seven o'clock at night, they let you go, right? Or you do it from home, which means you can start anytime you want to and any anytime you want to, as long as you, as you get your work done. Uh, but you'll take that part of the claim, all those photos and everything, it'll pop up in your system. And then you'll use their the adjuster, the field adjuster's scope um, and write an estimate based on that scope and the photos that they provided. This is what these days is commonly called a writer scoper program. And a lot of IA firms um, are going kind of to this model because they can kind of split things up. And I, I think partially because it may be easier to, uh, the, the field part of it's maybe arguably the easier part of um, this kind of work doing the claims work, right? So somebody goes out and take photo, takes photos and takes measurements and writes a little scope or doesn't write a scope, just takes photos only. Um, and then a slightly higher trained person can write an estimate based on that um, and then complete the file. Um, it may be, and it just, this is speaking in general terms, a uh, writer, somebody who's doing a, who's a desk adjuster, who's writing, doing this particular role that we're talking about. And I'll get into a couple more here in a second. Um, it may be that they are responsible for making a coverage decision, right? So they may, they may look at, at what the field adjuster sent up and say, okay, it looks like according to the policy that, that this insured has, this is covered, you know, to these limits. Um, and I can write the claim up and pay for it, things in X, Y, and Z way, right? Or it could be that they just write the estimate and then it all gets sent to the carrier and the carrier makes a coverage, coverage decision, contacts the insured and says, hey, your claim's covered, Here much, here's the total, or no, sorry, you know, based on the information that we received from the field adjuster, um, there's no coverage, right? So there's a, a whole bunch of different ways that this kind of works out as far as like this particular role of a desk adjuster. Um, the other way you can do it is you can, Theoretically, you can be your own desk adjuster, right? So if you get on, assigned to a, um, we'll just say a hurricane, 
and they give you 70 claims, right? So they may say, they may have a uh, um, big meeting or they may send out a big email or whatever that says, hey, listen, if you have claims, you're talking to the insured on the phone and it sounds like it's not gonna be more than a $2,500 claim or maybe a $5,000 claim, depending on, you know, it's, this is site specific. They'll make these decisions on site where how they're gonna do this, if they're even gonna do it, right? But in the past, in my experience, um, this is something that's that's come up a bunch of times, especially on these big events. If they if you can close it over the phone, a lot of times that's preferable to at least get some money to the insurance hand uh, to reduce your field workload so that you can get to everybody faster, right? So then you're technically you're a desk adjuster, right? So you are you're calling the homeowner, talking to him for a few minutes, and they say, yeah, well, you know, three sections of fence blew down, we had a tree, you know, hit the corner of the gazebo or crush a garden shed or whatever, and you know. And then, so then you could sit down right there on the, while you've got them on the phone and you can write that thing up and you can say, all right, well, listen, based on what you told me over the phone, um, it sound, looks like, you know, um, the grand total for all that damage would be around $2,000, right? You have a $500 deductible. We'll send you a check for 1500 bucks. Um, in this particular case, what I would say is I'd say, listen, you know, there's, if you find more damage or if you have a contractor come out and he says, well, there's no way we can do it for $2,000, um, call me back, right? And then if I need to come back out there, if I need to come out and scope it, I will, right? So you always wanna give the insured the impression that their their needs are gonna be met first and that you're there to, to try and take care of them no matter what their claim ends up being. Because it, it happens sometimes where, you know, you can do one of these over the phone things, contractor comes out and finds that, you know, another tree hit the back side of the house and knocked the house halfway off the foundation, right? That's going to be bigger than $2,000. Somebody's going to need to go out and meet the contractor, get photos, measurements, do the whole thing, right? Um, so in, in, that pers in that kind of perspective, um, you can be a desk adjuster just by handling a claim straight over the phone or via email. Um, on the carrier side, and I've, I've done work as a staff adjuster on the carrier side, you're kind of primarily a desk adjuster. Um, a lot of the stuff that you do, you're instructed to try to close the file over the phone. They'll give you like all these little things like, well, you know, when you're talking to the homeowner, if they have water damage in a room, you know, have them pace off the room with their feet, you know, find out what size shoe they are and have them walk across the room this way and then that way and then take photos with their, their or do a, a FaceTime with them and scope the loss that way and then send them a check. Let's get some money in these people's hands. So you, you're a lot of times you're, you're handling the file from the desk, right? There's a certain amount of efficiency to it, certainly. Um, and they're always trying, everybody's always experimenting with different ways of um, trying to reduce cycle times uh, so that the, the homeowner, and this is, this is really all this boils down to is, as, as somebody who purchases homeowner insurance, if I have a claim on my house for anything, I want somebody to call me right away within 24 hours of me filing a claim. Um, I want somebody to come out right away uh, and be able to answer questions, be able to make a coverage decision, be able to hand me a check, right? That would be like the ultimate customer experience for me, preferably the day after I file the claim, right? That would be the absolute best thing. Obviously, um, when you hear when you hear companies talk about cycle time, they're talking about the time from when the homeowner files the claim until the time they they have gotten some sort of a decision on the claim or of whether they've gotten a, a money in their hand. Typically, it's when you settle up with the homeowner over the phone or on, in person on site at the house that stops the clock on your cycle time, right? So, and, and then getting that claim uploaded back into exact analysis or back to your, your IA firm or whoever, so that they can be further processed, the check can be written, the, the estimates can be printed out, the, you know, the big, pretty, shiny, like carrier packet with the folder and the car, business cards and all that stuff in it, um, next steps and all that, um, with your, their estimate and a check in it gets sent to the homeowner. They may consider that to be, you know, when that gets sent, that's the, the cycle time clock stops then. Um, it just de kind of depends on who you're asking. All that being said, for our purposes as the adjuster, our, we want to we want to basically um, have an answer for the homeowner as to what the disposition of their claim is going to be. Is it going to get paid or not? And if it is, how much is it going to be paid? Um, and then what the next steps are. That's for us. That's you know once they get that estimate, uh, 
either emailed to them or we say it's going to be in the mail to them, that's when the clock stops as far as I'm concerned, um, cause that's my part of the job, right? If, if somebody drops the ball somewhere after me, then that's not technically my problem. It can become my problem if the homeowner calls me back and says, Hey, you said it was going to be here in a week and it's been 14 days. Where's my check? Then I'm going to make it my problem. I'm going to start calling around and say, Hey, listen, this claim should be closed. Look in exact analysis, et cetera. Um, so kind of digressing a little bit from um, desk adjusting, but w when we're talking about f uh, cycle time, what, we're, what, we're, what I mean to say is, and what I'm kind of trying to get at, is basically that um, the carriers and the IA firms are all trying to find ways to shorten that period of time where f for the customer, for the homeowner, um, so that they can get higher customer service ratings because they, f they found that the faster somebody gets money in their hands, um, not necessarily all other things being equal, um, they're going to get higher customer service ratings, which can go into their marketing, which goes into, you know, whether or not that homeowner is going to, uh, you know, promote the insurance company to their friends and family, which is really all they care about is, is whether they're going to keep that customer and whether that customer is going to tell other people about how great it was to be, to, to work with that, work with that particular insurance, with work to work with their insurance company. Right. Um, so we're always trying to find ways to uh, shorten cycle time. Um, another way that you can be a desk adjuster is, a quote unquote desk adjuster, is to be a file reviewer. Um, and a file reviewer, what they do is, is after whether the file had um, one person working on it, like a field person that went out, looked at the house, then went back to their hotel room or sat in their car or whatever, wrote it up, uh, and then settled up with the homeowner or has to wait to settle up with the homeowner until the file is reviewed or it's, it's two people, right? So one person out in the field sends it to the desk, the desk adjuster writer, and then the desk adjuster sends it up to the next level. There's always the, the next level is going to be generally speaking a file reviewer. And that's a person on the IA firm side who is sort of the gatekeeper between the IA firm and the carrier in that they, they want to make sure that the quality of the file that's getting sent is, um, th they're checking off all the boxes. The file looks good. It's not full of typos and misspellings. Everything is supposed to be in the file is there. All the photos that need to be there to represent that file, to tell the story of the file, those are all in the file. Everything's labeled. Um, and everything it's, they, that the carrier wants to have done and the, the level of quality that the IA firm wants to reflect back to the carrier on how their, their adjusters are handling claims, those are all done, right? So the, uh, so the file reviewer is gonna look through your file, make sure all that stuff's the way it's supposed to be, and then send it up to the next level. Um, the file reviewers are, generally speaking, it's one of those kind of jobs where it can be done by like an extremely inexperienced person or somebody who has zero knowledge about claims, or it can be a job that's that's left to people who have a lot of experience, who maybe retired from the field, they don't want to do field claims anymore, but they still want to do work. And they'll, the two different sort of paradigms there is that, f f technically speaking, a file reviewer is um, responsible for just making sure that everything's in there, right? It doesn't, you don't have to be like super experienced to say, Hey, we need a risk photo. The front of the, the photo of the front of the house needs to be in every single file ever. Um, there's no activity diary entries for contact and the things that are required on this checklist. So the person with no experience can just go down a checklist and say, "This is these things are in there. These th things are not in there." Send an email out saying, "Hey, you're missing these four things. Fix that. Send it back up." Right? Or on the for a, an experienced file reviewer, um, which kind of will m sort of meld into the next role, which I'm going to say in a second. Um, but they will be like, they'll look through your estimate and say, Hey, you know, everything looks good on your roof estimate on your siding though. Um, we don't need to have these line items in there, or you forgot to put those line items in, um, looking at your photos. It looks like there's something that should be detached and reset in order to do that repair process. So they're going to be a little bit more, um, you know, an experienced file reviewer is going to be somebody that will do more like estimate level sort of things to help the, the, the original adjuster make their file look better, right? They're still gonna go through that checklist of things. Um, and it may be, I think, 
generally speaking, you're probably going to see like the, the people who don't really know anything about claims who are going down the checklist as file reviewers, it's going to be on the big, 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 big events. I've been a file reviewer on hurricanes after I'd had years of experience and had people call me up and chew me out, tell, you know, making a big deal about how none of the file reviewers know anything. And, you know, it's I, because I'm telling them, you know, I'm going down the checklist. I'm saying, Hey, you're missing these five things. Right. You know, and so they get all bent out of shape about it, but they probably were having other file reviewers who didn't know anything, you know, going through their files and telling them to fix things that they didn't really understand, or it was, it was in there in some other way. Um, so they have misunderstandings. Um, so another sort of a, of a desk sort of remote work person. And that is where, where you have more of a, uh, uh, experienced file reviewer, experienced adjuster who's doing file review is, is more of a quality assurance person, which is a QA, right? So QA is going to go through your file pretty much like a file reviewer does, but they're going to be, you know, a, a, a traditional QA role um, will go rescope the loss. They'll call the homeowner, um, you know, explain who they are, explain that they want it for quality assurance purposes. They want to rescope the loss. They'll go rescope the loss and they'll do their own whole estimate and everything based on strictly by the estimating guidelines and what they think should be done on this file. And then they'll hold your, your file up to their file and say, all right, you know, you overwrote this, you underwrote this, you missed this, you missed this. Um, you get a 74, right? You know, the, the homeowner said that you were really, really good with them. We, we're going to get a 97 on your customer service. So they'll go through and grade you and sort of do an assessment, um, like a performance review. Um, so quality assurance is that's for reserved for generally for, for carrier people who have a lot of experience, um, will be QA people and they will, um, if you're, if you're on a deployment and you've been there for two weeks and you get a phone call from somebody that says, Hey, this is Steve Jones from, you know, a Acme insurance company. I'm a, a quality assurance guy. And I, I looked at a few of your files and I just, if, if you've got a half an hour, I want to talk to you about these. Cause there's some things that we need to change. And they may have you change something or they may say, Oh, we, we fixed it for you. And, uh, you know, don't worry about it. But next time don't do that on your files or make sure you include A, B, and C in your file because it wasn't there on, on these files, right? So a quality assurance person um, may be more of a, I think a lot of IA firms will have a QA person. Um, it's going to be a little bit more of a, a, you know, whereas like the scoper and the writer roles, there's going to be a lot of those, right? Because, you know, you, they need a lot of people to write these, these estimates. They don't need as many people to review files or to do quality assurance. Um, as far as a staff adjuster, I mentioned that briefly. Um, not really, we're talking about independent adjusters here, so we're not really going to talk about, I'm not going to go into to depth about being a staff adjuster and, be, and doing desk work as a staff adjuster because it's, it's kind of a whole different sort of a animal. But speaking of working from home, who doesn't want to work from the comfort of their own home and make great money? If this is you, then you need to know about the iFirm Paysetter Claim Service. They've got remote desk work from home opportunities, but if you still want to work from the field, you can. Paysetter's Evo platform is fully integrated with Hover, and it is the best of the app-based claims handling systems out there that I know of. Technology is moving faster than ever, and Paysetter is right there at the cutting edge. Download the free guide to maximizing your productivity while working in your pajamas and get a link to apply to this dynamic firm. And you can find both at adjustertv.com slash Paysetter. So I kind of want to talk a little bit about how to get this kind of work and sort of what sort of skills that you as an adjuster need to cultivate um, in order to, or, or somebody who's new to, to claims adjusting, um, in order to, uh, to get this kind of work and to be good and, to, and to be successful at it. Um, I, I think still, and it's been this way for a while, and I, I don't think it's really changed, um, but the traditional way for somebody to find themselves in a remote uh, only sort of desk adjusting role where they're writing estimates is that generally speaking, like a, you know, we could even say as, as like a, like a daily adjuster almost um, is generally going to be going to, is that you, you probably are going to need to have some field experience, get licensed, get trained tr in a traditional way. I, I, I recommend hands-on training um, from a good school. Um, and 
uh, getting spending time networking with the uh, IA firms and getting on their rosters and getting work, right? So when you get out in the field and you um, you do the kind of work that we do as, as field adjusters, on, as property adjusters, um, it helps to, uh, it'll help you be a better uh, desk adjuster and I think even vice versa. So once you've had experience as a, as a desk adjust, or as a field adjuster, um, you've done a lot of deployments, you've, you've had to dig into the policy. Um, as a desk adjuster, um, you'll start to kind of see uh, th see things from somebody else's sort of perspective. You'll see the, the, the field role from the desk. So in other words, you're, you're gonna be able to see um, what other adjusters are doing that look make their files look better than what maybe you're doing, and this is this is what I learned. Um, and then you'll be able to see the things that people are doing wrong, and you know you have opportunities in some cases to help people in the field who who need who could be more effective, probably save time, um, get more work done, um, and have a, a nicer looking file, and, and be able to provide better information and data from the the field inspection to the desk and then so on and so forth. So the, the desk role um, really kind of gives you an opportunity to um, be a better adjuster, you know, truthfully. But I think that a field the field deployment is still gonna probably be um, the easiest end to it because you're going to develop a relationship, you know, you'll develop a uh, reputation as being somebody who is, Gets, has good cycle time, has a good quality file, has good customer service, you know, and if you don't, if you're not right out of the gate, like acing all those, all those metrics that you have pot the potential to, right? So they're going to, the I firms and the carriers even as well, what they're watching you when you're on your deployments, when, when they, they know that you're brand new and they're going to keep an eye on you, right? So they're going to say, all right, well, this person seems to be getting it. Um, you know, let's try to, to help them um, because we can sort of mold them and, and help them be better. And we need people, you know, to do this kind of work because as they're shorthanded, everybody's shorthanded, um, believe it or not. Um, people who are failing at it, who are not turning the work in, who aren't answering their phone, who don't seem to be getting or the work that they do turn in looks terrible. That person's never, ever going to find their way into a desk, desk role because they're never going to find their way past that first deployment. They may just stop getting new claims and never hear from the IA firm again, right? This is, that's kind of how you're, one of the ways that you're fired from a, a storm deployment is they just stop giving you claims and then that's it, right? Whatever you've got left, if you can close them, you close them. If not, they take them away, right? So having, being able to prove yourself um, and learn, you know, scoping a loss, taking photos, what, what makes sense to get photos of and what makes sense not to get photos of, um, uh, and even writing estimates while you're in the field, um, or as a field adjuster is, uh, really probably, you know, if it's, it's probably the best way I think to kind of get, you know, to, to make sure that you have a, a really, really good foundation for being a desk adjuster or taking other roles where you're, um, you know, you, maybe you're not the, the, the first point of contact for the insured or you're doing some, you know, you're a manager or your field support or you're a file reviewer or you get into a QA role at this really doing the, the actual like it's sort of like the, the ground floor role. I would recommend, you know, given the option to take field claims if you can. Um, but that being said, um, you still don't necessarily uh, need to do that these days in particular in order to get the desk adjusting role, especially one where you're just the writer, right? So um, you're still going to have to have some understanding of, of construction and restoration processes. So in other words, if, if there's a, you know, damage to the bottom of the drywall and the, and the, the carpet and the, the baseboard that you know how to write, how a contractor would you know, using customary and reasonable construction methods and techniques and materials and all that stuff, how a contractor would tear all that stuff out and put it back in, put new back in so that it looks exactly the same as it did before. You need to know how to do that. Whether you get it, that, that knowledge in the field or whether you pick it up some other way, whether you're, you maybe you're a contractor or an estimator for a, you know, like a serve pro or, or service master or water mitigation company, something like that, you can come at it a bunch of different ways. Um, but you can still um, do, 
get you get involved in writer programs where you're working remotely and a lot of IA firms um, are going to train you they're going to help you with this stuff um, so and, they, and they're not going to give you total losses right out of the gate um, they may just give you like simple claims to get to get you started um, so you do need to probably have a little bit of understanding of policy if you're going to be making any coverage decisions um, so this is kind of where licensing, I, I feel like, is, is a really good crash course in um, understanding policy, um, especially doing continuing education, um, because then you have to kind of dig into different sort of like, you know, license, insurance, uh, sort of like, I don't know what the right word to say is, but it's like sort of like the the nomenclature or like the sort of the world of insurance, the things that they talk about it and a lot of the CE classes that you can take. And there's hundreds, if not thousands of different topics that you can get in uh, CE. But if I were you, if it were me, and this is what I kind of tried to do is, is would be to say, all right, well, I don't know a whole lot about condo claims. Here's a condo, you know, eight hours of, or four hours or whatever of uh, condo specific, um, CE training, right? So then I'd, I'd really dive into that and learn as much as I could about condos. Because condos, you can, there's a lot of condominiums in the country and it's, their policies are weird and they can be very confusing for people, especially new people. And they can be frustrating as well. Um, so learning condos opens up a new avenue for you. You know, you may, you may get a call from your manager who's saying, hey, listen, you know, um, we have an opportunity for somebody to do desk work on a bunch of condo claims. Right, or, or, or be, become part of the, the condo claims unit or something like that. You know, maybe worth it to get into that because not everybody's going to want to do that. And your manager is going to be, you know, probably scrambling to find somebody to, to fill that role. And he's going to be making a lot of phone calls and getting a lot of no way I hate condos answers, which is not what he, he or she wants to hear. But if you're like, oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll, uh, I'm willing to learn that. Um, I already took some TE with it. I took some training. I took of this. I took of that. You know, I, I did some legwork on my own. I've handled a few condo claims um, in the field. I want to jump on that team and do those remotely. That kind of thing happens all the time, right? If, and for, for really any aspect of claims. Um, for quality assurance, again, like I mentioned previously, um, and I would say if, especially also for file reviewers, unless you're talking about like major like tens of hundreds of thousands of claims and they just need to throw warm bodies out. They're going to throw warm bodies, not just in the field, but also behind desks, on phones, everywhere. It's just going to be nothing but warm bodies, right? Um, but, but in normal circumstances, quality assurance, if you're going to become a quality assurance person for uh, an IA firm, um, you're going to need a lot of experience. You're going to need to have done the field role and be, be a desk adjuster um, and probably be a file reviewer and do every other role um, that you're going to be kind of like above and sort of not managing necessarily, but that you're going to be like, you know, you're critiquing this person's work and, or in helping this person get their file straightened out. So coming up in a second, I want to talk about um, how to really kind of like get focused, like dialed in training um, for the desk adjuster role. And I mentioned previously, you know, that there's I think that being a field adjuster first before you do anything is probably the best preparation, um, but it's not the only way. Um, so in a minute, we'll, I'll kind of go into sort of like what other ways you can get trained specifically to be a desk adjuster or a desk reviewer, um, somebody who works remotely just out of their computer. Um, first, facing a lawsuit can be a terrifying and stressful experience, and it can je jeopardize your years of hard work and success. Smart adjusters understand the importance of protecting themselves from financial harm. And when I talk about years of success, I mean, you spend a lot of money on becoming an adjuster, getting trained up, getting a bunch of licenses, buying gear, maybe you had to like upgrade your vehicle a little bit, getting ladders, getting a new laptop, paying for software, all that stuff. Um, that stuff is not inexpensive and it takes time to get it, right? Um, you can get an LLC if you really want to, and in some cases it probably probably makes sense, but you have to understand that the corporate veil is called a veil for a reason. It's not a wall, and it can be, it's easy to poke a finger right in there, right? So there's a better way to protect yourself if you're deposed or sued, and that is what ENO, aka Errors and Emissions Insurance, is for. If you don't have 
adequate insurance coverage as an adjuster, you're putting yourself at great financial risk. If you make your living from handling claims as an independent adjuster, then you must get errors and omissions and general liability insurance cover. It doesn't matter if you're W-2 or 1099, or even if you work like Carrier Direct. Protect yourself with professional liability insurance from Kaplik. And to find out more and to download the free insurance for adjusters guide, head on over to cplic.net slash adjuster TV. Again, that's cplic.net slash adjuster TV. Okay. So for, as far as training goes, um, there are a, a few different ways that you can get training. I would say going to a traditional hands-on school, um, like Mile High, Vail, Veteran Adjusting School, Caddy, um, any of the IA firms that have uh, that have recently in the last couple of years um, sort of kickstarted their their hands-on training programs. A lot of those companies, uh, a lot of those IA firms are going to be doing like kind of like generic. Um, it adjust your training, right? Because um, typically, again, sort of traditionally, independent adjusting firms, they'll say, yeah, well, you come over, we'll get you trained up and everything, but they're going to train you to a carrier certification. So you're not going to show up for for like a adjuster 101 um, at a necessarily, at, a, at least used to, at an IA firm where they said, all right, well, here's, you know, here's everything that you need to know about being an adjuster um, we're going to teach you how to use Xactimate. We're going to teach you this, that, and the other thing. Um, they would say, Hey, thanks for getting on our roster. You know, you're, you look like you've got the basics on your resume. Um, keep getting licenses and everything, but you got to attend this carrier certification training. And that's going to be like, they'll cover Xactimate. They'll cover things like that, but it's going to be to train you to a carrier. Um, they have these days, you've got both options at a lot of companies. Um, the best thing I could tell you to do is to call and say, hey, um, you know, if, if you're on somebody's roster or you want to get on their roster, just call up their the toll-free number on their website and ask them, say, you know, do you guys offer training for new adjusters? If some if I, if I come to you and I don't know anything, do you have can you train me whether I have to, I pay for it or if it's free? And then they'll tell you. And if they don't, then say can you recommend a school for me to go to? I want to do f field work or I want to be a remote desk adjuster. What do I have to do in order to get trained for that? And they will tell you, right? Because they want you to, they're going to they're gonna say that they're going to want you to show up and know how to do the work, right? Even if you go to a, a, a training session, you still want to show up at a, to an IA firm training, having seen this stuff before. And, and at the at bare minimum, Having used Xactimate, installed Xactimate on a computer, um, used it, uh, practiced with it, taken trainings with it, maybe even gotten a level two or a level three certification so that you know where everything is in it and you've got some fluency in Xactimate. Um, in that case, yeah. So I would say you get uh, trained traditionally, right? So you go to an adjuster school and let them show you how to be an adjuster. Um, the second way, and this is something new that's come out in the last 12 months or so, not even, I think it was, yeah, it's about 12 months. So just started in 2021 and Hague Education, um, which if you missed it, we did a huge um, sort of a tour of their lab in Flower Mound, Texas and got the ice ball guns and everything and, and got to see all the different tests that they do to materials in order to, to check for, you know, if, is it really damaged or is it not damaged kind of a thing, but it's a really, really great video. You can check that out up here. Um, but they have a lot of, uh, training specifically geared towards insurance adjusters and contractors, but they've got some that it's only for insurance adjusters. Um, specifically if in this case, they have something called the Hague Certified Reviewer Program, and it's you go to HagueCertifiedReviewer.com, um, and they've got uh, three uh, or four. I don't know if they've got the fourth one out yet, but they have th um, th three main levels of certification to get you started, and I think the fourth level is is like uh, um, sort of like a more electives to help you kind of drill down more into individual parts of you know sort of like expand your expertise with more specific other kind of training. So they will teach you how to be a desk. It says certified reviewer, but it's basically a desk adjuster. So they're going to teach you construction. Um, they're going to teach you damage identification and they're going to teach you software and I believe some policy stuff. 
Um, and this is stuff that you're going to need to know as a desk adjuster, right? And so this to me, and, I, and I've audited this training, so I've, I've seen it. I've talked to uh, Ryan, who's the director of training, who's the president or the the president of Hague Education, which oversees all of this, all their training stuff. There's, you know, their certified inspector, their all their roof inspection programs, all that stuff. Um, and they they made this specifically with the help of the insurance industry from carriers and IA firms, and they had contractors come in and consult with them as well as when they were building this training, so that it is something that will will fully prepare you to be a. Uh, desk adjuster, right? Desk reviewer, desk adjuster, whatever. Um, it kind of covers everything. And honestly, from what I saw when I, t when I sort of went through the training, I think it would be even good for uh, somebody who wants to be a field adjuster, but maybe doesn't have the time or they wanted something a little bit more self-paced um, at home on their, you know, looking at videos on their laptop, watching online training. It's good for a field role as well, I think, because it covers everything. It covers construction. It covers, like I said, you know, estimating um, and all that stuff, damage identification, which you got to know all that stuff, right? So um, they say, Hague told, uh, told me that it's, it's geared towards helping somebody who's never seen any of this stuff before, um, who wants to do a desk uh, specific remote kind of work. Um, so I would say short of sitting around waiting for a field deployment, I would jump on Hague Education's Hague Certified Reviewer Program um, because you could do it right now. I mean, you could literally start it right now. It's, it's not very expensive. I, I managed to work out a coupon code uh, with Hague um, so we can get you a little bit of a discount on it. Um, that coupon code is, is Adjuster TV, and it's all one word. It doesn't have to be capitalized or anything. Adjuster TV. Um, and you can use that for a discount on anything that you get at HagueEducation.com. So any of the tools, the books, um, the, the Hague Certified Reviewer Program, um, all that stuff, right? So just put that code in there and you'll get a nice, you'll get a, a nice little discount um, that w should help you out when you get this. I would strongly recommend this as a way to uh, kind of shortcut absolutely shortcut the learning curve and it's going to look good on a resume the i firms you know they recognize this this certification from haig um and uh it's going to help you to know how to write claims and to or to know how to review claims um and even if you just get out in the field um it'll give you an a leg up over you know if if you're if it's a difference between knowing zero about claims and damage identification and construction and then going on a big hurricane or paying some money for Hague certified reviewer program that's not necessarily geared towards field, but you go do field claims and you took that training, you got a level three certification, the one, two, and three certifications, and you've learned all that stuff. Your chances of um, surviving your first CAT deployment are, I would say, tenfold better. So that's just me. The other way I think that you can kind of gain a little bit of experience is uh, to start doing um, virtual assist stuff, which is really the, the scoper part of this. Um, if you know both roles, right? So in other words, if you, you go out in the field and, or if, and even if you do both roles, right? So if, if you're like, if the only thing that you can get right now is, um, uh, being a, a scoper, right? So you're, you're just walking around people's houses with your phone and taking pictures of everything. And maybe you write a scope, you settle assist or something like that, or you don't, you just take pictures only. Um, it's going to, you're going to start building experience on scoping losses. You have to talk to the insured if they're home. Um, and uh, it's, it's kind of the, the, it's a really good way to kind of ease your way into it. When you start doing the desk part of that, like you do the writer part of that, and you, but you're still doing the, the, the scoper part, you'll instantly get better at scoping because you're going to see, oh, well, as a, as a writer, I need to, the adjuster to do these other things that I'm not doing. Um, so I think that, that uh, the virtual stuff, and, and I've talked about it in the past, it's not going away. Um, whether you're in the field as, as strictly just doing photo and scope or you are sitting at a desk, you know, you're sitting in your pajamas or you're sitting at Starbucks or whatever, and you're writing claims or you're just doing a file review or just, you know, whatever you're doing. Um, the IA firms are 
and the carrier, so they're not gonna like stop splitting this role up, right? So the traditional role of the adjuster is still there where I get assigned, you know, as a traditional adjuster, I get assigned the claim and I call the homeowner, set the appointment, call the contractor, go to the house, scope it, photograph it, diagram everything, um, make a coverage decision, negotiate with the contractor, write the estimate, um, settle up with the homeowner, maybe even write them a check, right? That's That traditional role is always gonna be there. Every time I talk to somebody, uh, and it's not going to change it, when we go to NACA um, in a couple, that's next week, next week or the week after. Anyway, it's very, very soon, end of, or end of uh, January. Um, I'm going to ask them, I always ask them, because this is important, right? Because it's, it's if, if, if I hear people starting to say, well, you know, I think uh, this, is the, this is it, this is the end, we're done, then, you know, then I'm going to let you guys know, and we're going to try to find something else better to do, Right all of us, right? Um, but nobody has said that, that that's that's the case. The carriers don't want that to, to happen. They don't want the traditional adjuster role to go away. Customers don't want it to go away. Think about yourself as a homeowner, right? And what you would want to have is the ultimate, you have a big fire in your house, maybe your house burns down, or you have a flood, um, or some other like major catastrophe in your house. You don't want somebody walking around your house in flip flops and board shorts, with the phone up, I can't answer any questions. You'll just have to wait till somebody else calls you, right? I'm going to be mad. I'm, my insurance agent's phone's going to light up the second that happens. Um, so that isn't going to happen. I just, it's, it's a people person job. Um, these tools that they have for us, um, every year something new comes out, those tools are there to make our jobs better make us faster, make us more efficient, make us more effective, help us to write a more accurate file so that the homeowner doesn't have to have the file process drag out with, you know, they didn't get all the damage on the first one, the estimate's too low on the first one because they didn't write it right. Those things are starting, they're starting to, to, tie, to dial in the, the, the quality level of the file and these tools let us help us be faster, have a, a much more accurate file right out of the gate, which is what everybody, literally everybody wants. Um, so the, the virtual stuff isn't going away. Um, you know, and again, like I said in the beginning, even 20 years ago, on a hurricane, um, they, were still, they would still say, hey, listen, if you, if you can close some of these over the phone, do it. Absolutely, 100% do it, because it's just you know, one or six or 10 less that you have to go drive around all over the countryside to do when it would have been super easy to close it over the phone. You know, four sections of fence blown down, you know, above ground pool smashed, you know, whatever it is, right? Um, it doesn't make sense to, to go do, to go run around and do those field claims like that, that are small, that you, it's super simple that you can absolutely, the homeowner texts you a couple of pictures of the damage, um, when you could be doing the total losses on the coast, right? So in a minute, I kind of want to talk about how available this sort of work is to new and experienced adjusters um, and sort of how prevalent it is um, versus doing like, a, the, like I just was talking about the traditional adjuster role. Um, but first, I want to let you know that it doesn't matter where you live because as long as you have the internet, you can write claims as a desk adjuster. But in order to work claims remotely, you've got to have state licenses. For example, you cannot work Minnesota claims remotely without a Minnesota license. So if you live in Texas and you've got a Texas license, you still got to get a Minnesota license to, to handle claims remotely from Minnesota. In other words, the more licenses you have, the more work you can get. Of all the credentials you need as an adjuster, there's really none more important than your adjuster license, especially your first one. Some adjuster schools even re require you to have one before they will let you enroll. Adjuster Pro provides a comprehensive and easy to use way to get and maintain your adjuster licenses. Adjuster Pro is dedicated to helping you thrive as an adjuster with resources for every licensing state, including dead simple CE packages, Adjuster Pro is the gold standard for adjuster licensing. You'll find everything that you need to get licensed in one place. Just go to adjustertv.com slash adjusterpro right now. So how available is this kind of work? So as, as far as like sort of the, the, the annual, the sort of the yearly cycle of uh, claims work for adjusters, basically summer's a high time, you know, it's spring storm season starts up and it's on. Right. In, in, in the middle of the country, you know, I, I've, I've got a 
ton of videos about it, but between, we'll say like the front range of Colorado, um, in a box from the front range of Colorado over to like, you know, Ohio ish area, um, West Virginia, and then, you know, from east to west and then north to south from Canada, including Canada, um, to the Mexican border and in South Texas, um, spring storm season is always going to produce something, right? There's always something And some places get a lot of hail, um, depending on how populated an area is, we'll say Texas is, is heavily populated, especially that, um, kind of I 35 corridor up the middle of the state. There are tens of millions of people that live in Texas, right? And Texas gets a lot of hail. Um, Texas is, I was told one time that, um, Texas costs insurance companies, um, more than the next five hail states combined, which is a lot considering that the, the state that gets the most hail is Wyoming, which should tell you something. It's not very populated. There's only a few towns that have, you know, more than 10,000 people in them. Um, the front range of Colorado from Fort Collins down to Pueblo and south of there, it's pretty heavily populated. Denver, um, they get a lot of hail. They get tornadoes, they get high winds. Um, right. So, and then you, it, you go into the Midwest and you've got the big cities in the Midwest. You've got Chicago, you've got Minneapolis, you've got Milwaukee, you've got Kansas City, you've got Oklahoma City, um, St. Louis, you know, Indianapolis, Memphis, Nashville, so on and so forth. So there's a lot of places where they get, they're going to get bad weather in the spring. It's just, they know they are. They've got tornado sirens set up all over the place. Going to get bad weather, right? As the summer wears on, that, that kind of like tapers a little bit. And then the hurricane season kicks up. Hurricane season officially starts at the end of May. Beginning of May, it's either beginning of May or the end. I think it's the 31st of May. Um, officially, right? You've, we've had hurricanes earlier than, than the beginning of hurricane season and later as well, but those are outliers. Um, as far as I'm concerned, uh, hurricane season doesn't really start until the middle of August, f f from my experience. Every hurricane, I think without exception, well, may maybe with Sandy being the exception, happened between um, the middle of and maybe that wasn't even an exception. It happened, every hurricane I ever worked happened between the middle of August and the middle of October, right? So the, the peak, September is the is like the, the pinnacle. If you, if you look at the stats, like 80 plus percent of any hurricane that does any, any damage to the U.S. mainland um, occurs in September, right? That's just, that's where the peak is. Um, so, but that being said, you know, those are catastrophe claims, right? So catastrophe stuff is going to fall off in the winter time. Obviously, this past winter we had um, tornadoes, a big tornado outbreak, that terrible, terrible outbreak that happened. I think it was in November or early December, um, caused a lot of damage and uh, loss of life, right, across several states. Um, you can have hailstorms late season, November, December. Uh, you can have winter storms. You know, there's there's uh, blizzards. There's so weight of snow storms. You can have ice dam. Um, you can have uh, wind storms. You can have ice storms themselves, especially in the Midwest, like Kansas City, St. Louis, um, you know, in Missouri, um, Kansas, Oklahoma, um, because they're a little bit, they're not, they get snow in the wintertime, but they, it'll be cold more than it'll snow in some of those places, but they'll get ice because there's like, they're on like kind of that boundary between the warmer s Southern states and like the colder Northern states. So they get a lot of ice. Ice is going to pull power lines down. It's going to pull lots of trees are going to be down from ice. And that causes a lot of damage. You're going to get through technically tree claims for the most part on ice, on ice storm claims. Um, and they super easy to do. Uh, the damage is generally speaking is, fairly minimal with certainly with exceptions it's repetitive um i like ice storm it's pretty easy that's they're and they're they're you know I, I hesitate to use the word fun but they're they're uh not it's not that challenging compared to other st storm types so you can have uh work during the winter for cap but for probably the vast majority of a lot of this stuff um you're gonna have it's gonna be more sort of wind and daily sort of centered kinds of things, right? So I think for a lot of uh, uh, daily claims, they're not going to be farming these out to a scoper writer program necessarily because those are generally uh, daily claims can get 
pretty complex pretty quickly, um, and they still want to have somebody. You know, those are regular old water damage claims for the most part, fires, vandalism, things like that, that it may not make sense to have a scope or writer on. So your, your scope or writer work may be primarily during the peak of the storm season. Um, but, and again, it also depends on where you live. If you live in Minneapolis or you live in Fargo or something like that, um, you may, it may be pretty dead in the, in the winter time for you. Um, unless there's some sort of a big winter event. Um, so I would say that try to do this kind of work wherever possible. If you are um, an experienced adjuster and you want to have a little bit of extra gig work, like if you don't want to drive for Uber or deliver food, you can do scoper, you can do uh, roof inspections. Crawford has uh, something for roof inspecting where some carrier or somebody will call Crawford Inspection Services is what it's called. And they'll say, hey, uh, we need somebody to me diagram and measure this roof, take photos of it. You know, they're going to do something with it or they think there's damage to it or it's not always necessarily to do with the insurance claim is my point. It's just roof inspections only. Um, and that's it. You can go to cis.global. It's cis.claims.global. Um, Pilot Catastrophe has um, inspectors on demand and adjusters on demand. There's two, two different sort of like uh, in-app um, sort of uh, platforms that they have. Um, th those are, you know, they've, they've been around for several years now, going on at least four or five years. Um, so they're really getting those dialed, down and, and dialed in and they're, and they're getting a lot more volume with those kinds of things. Uh, Paysetter has an Evo platform. You go to paysetter.com. Uh, PaysetterClaims.com. Um, you can look into that, and you can, uh, you know, Crawford also has We Go Look, which does um, property and auto. Um, there's On Source Online, which is auto only, so you can walk around. You've got a little app for that, um, and you can, you know, you can get into the the, the virtual assist virtual claims sort of thing to kind of get your feet wet and get started into this work. And I will tell you that they've told me, you know, pilots told me and a number of other firms have told me that they will hire out of their virtual adjusting uh, sort of roster. So people who, who do a lot of virtual claims, um, inspectors on demand, et cetera, um, they will, they're, they're, they're looking. I mean, they're, they're, every company is always looking for, for good people. Um, so they're going to be keeping an eye out for who's who's doing well at that, who's doing a lot of it. Um, and you may find yourself getting called and presented with other opportunities. Um, so uh, I would say that there's, you know, I listed off, we go look, um, pay setter, it's got d d remote desk stuff. I would say that um, call every IA firm who's, that you're on the or whose roster that you're on and as well as anybody whose roster you're not on and ask them and say, Hey, you know, I'm looking for, I, I can't, you know, do field deployments because I don't have a good vehicle or I have a, a disability or an injury or something like that. And you're just not able to do it. Um, or you just want to do it, right. You, you don't want to leave. You don't want, you have to look after the kids or whatever it is, whatever reason you want to stay home, um, call and ask. Um, because these days the carriers are asking for it a lot. Um, you, when you go to the, a lot of companies' websites, it may not say exactly what they have. Um, so I'm, I'm going to always say to pick up the phone and call, and you'll know for sure. You know, be able to talk to somebody at HR, be able to talk, call and say, "Hey, got to talk to somebody in recruiting or human resources. I have some questions," and they'll, you know, whoever answered the phone will send you to that, you know, to to a person that can answer that question for you. If that person can't answer that question for you. Say, "Well, is there somebody who can?" Right? Don't stop until you get the answer that you know that you want. Whether that's no, sorry, we don't, we don't do that at all. Or we only take people who've got five years of experience before we put them in a desk roll. Then you have your answer, right? Um, or, hey, we've got a training next month, you know, just specifically for that, why don't you attend it, right? You, these things pop up all the time. Um, so I, I strongly recommend just calling every single firm that you can think of, um, even ones that don't traditionally say or haven't really advertised that they have remote work like this, call and ask, bottom line, right? Um, a great opportunity, and I mentioned it a minute ago, is to go to the uh, convention in Las Vegas um, for the National Association of Catastrophe Adjusters. January 23rd through the 27th is um, the 2022 NA uh, NACA convention. It's at the Flamingo in Las Vegas, and 
we're going to be there. Jester TV is going to be there. Um, we've got some, you know, swag and stuff like that that we're going to be handing out while supplies last, of course. Um, Crawford has their catastrophe con uh, c conference, which they call a cat con. Um, if you go to crawco.com slash cat, there's a, there's a learn more button and some information on there about their particular uh, conference. And that is starts like the, the last, it's like the 27th of February through, um, it's like the first couple of, it's like the, basically the first week of March, uh, whatever that is. Um, and they've got early bird pricing is going on right now for still for both of those conferences. Um, you can still get a discount for the National Association of Catastrophe Adjusters conference um, up until the day before the conference itself. It's $5.99 for a member and $7.99 for a non-member. Um, but that goes up for both of those. If you try to buy on site, um, 200 bucks each. So it's it's 800 bucks for a member. If you if you show up at the conference and say, hey, I want to attend, it's $800 if you're a member and it's a thousand dollars if you're not a member. It sounds expensive, but you have to remember that you are basically getting access to 40 or 50 uh, I firms, a whole gigantic, huge pile of continuing education and training. There's carrier certifications. There's like seven different tracks. There's a flood track. There's, I mean, there's so many different. It's it's a pretty big deal. Um, and the networking is, is frankly, it's priceless. The hotels aren't very expensive, um, thankfully. Um, so it's not going to be like you're spending, you're not spending a thousand dollars on a hotel unless you want to, I guess. Um, it's, it's a lot more inexpensive than that. Um, but the networking opportunities for these conferences are worth their weight in gold, um, I think. And I, honestly, if I uh, was just going to go for my career, I would spend twice what they're charging. I would spend $2,000 just, just, to get into this conference, if that's what it costs, I think it would be worth it. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that they raise the price to that at all, I promise. Um, but I think it's worth it. So, but you can still kind of get your hands on um, early bird pricing uh, if you jump right now. And if you become a member, then it's a little bit cheaper. Membership has its benefits, of course. Um, but definitely jump on those conferences um, because. You can just ask them to their face, say, hey, you know, do you guys have remote desk work? And they'll say, yeah, we do. Absolutely. Here's, a, here's some information about it. I'm going to put you in our system as somebody who's interested in that. Or no, we don't do that at all. And they'll, they'll just tell you, right? So you'll know. Um, and like I said, I'll be at both of those conferences um, this spring or I guess this winter. Um, so you can come over and if you've got specific questions, come over and sit down and talk about it. If you want to get in front of the camera, we'll put you in front of the camera. No problem. Um, most of the other I firms that I've talked to are also doing conferences, mid America cat, um, mid -am -cat .com. They've got a conference. I think it's it coincides with NACA. So if you're in San Antonio area, although it may be in Biloxi, I'll have to look it up. Um, I think they may be doing it in, in Mississippi. Um, but either way, if you're in the South and you don't want to go all the way to Vegas, you can still go to the Mid-America Cat Conference. Um, and they're an IA firm. So it's going to be kind of an IA firm specific one. Um, but it's, again, great networking. Those are great guys. And those are guys, you know, that are building that company and they come from a bunch of different other firms. So they know everybody. So, um, you know, Paysetter has got a, a road show coming up for this summer. I believe Crawford's got one. Um, Eberl, I'm, I'm certain is doing, um, road shows this summer. Um, so everybody's been going to be doing a lot of live events. Um, and those aren't the only ones, you know, again, you can call, if you want to go to a live event, they're going to be having them. Um, and I'm, if you're a, an IA firm and you've got a, a live event that you want to promote, you know, for this summer, for 2022, go to adjustertv.com slash contact, shoot me a note and we'll see about getting, mentioned it in a Jester TV video so that you can get some more people showing up to it. So anyway, that's it for me. I really hope you got some value from this conversation. The industry really is moving pretty quickly and the people who are going to capitalize on the opportunities are the ones who put themselves out there and start getting to know the folks at the IA firms who do the hiring. Because you know what? Those people are the ones who have to scramble to find adjusters like you when one of their carrier clients makes the big demands for people to do this kind of work. Let it be you. As always, thank you so much for watching and have a great storm. This is Adjuster TV.